Hello, everyone, and welcome to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. With me, as always, is my loyal co-host, Michael Walker. How are you doing, Walker? Fantastic. I'm very glad to hear it. The sinister smile on your face seems to indicate that you have something in store for me. I am your unsuspecting co-host, Mark Bigney. We're going to mix things up this week. We're going to talk about board games. We're going to talk about the games we played this week. We're going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter. And we're going to talk about our feature game. It's been five minutes since the last release of John D. Clare, and so we're going to review Rolling Heights by John D. Clare. He's got it going. He's got Ready, Set, Bet. He's getting a lot of buzz. Rolling Heights is here. He's just an onslaught of games year after year. It's true. He releases about as many games as David Thompson, except most David Thompson designs are co-designs, and of course, also all David Thompson designs are amazing. Two salient differences between David Thompson and... Anyway, <laughs> I, should, I shouldn't try to foreshadow the review this, that much. So, Walker, what did you play last week? Mark, I got to try Astra. This is a Mind Clash game, but it's not really a Mind Clash game because Mind Clash games have tons of subsystems and giant boxes and huge productions. This is this, not... it's, a new, it's a new subline that they release direct to retail that they intend to be more accessible and approachable, yeah. yeah this, I don't want to call it a roll and write, but you are writing. Okay. It's all about constellations. And you get so many, like, sort of, I want to say action points, but you get gems, and you run out of gems, but you use these gems to connect the dots of your of your constellations. I love connect the dots. And it's sort of uh, uh, area majority, because, you know, you're sort of both fighting to finish it off, and when you finish it off, whoever is the most gets the card, and they can get victory points with the card, or they can use the cards for its special abilities, and there's whole dial for the elements or, or the times of the seasons not very much going on i'm glad i didn't buy it <laughs> i'm not saying it's bad i'm just saying it's just not my thing what is it what is it that left you disappointed was it the high expectations of a mind clash game no no i i did not have high i knew what it was going in i see it's just rolling rights or that kind of game is not my thing i see I don't know. I'm I'm having difficulty. This is entirely unreasonable, but you describe the game and I'm thinking, is this Starlink meets Dungeon Scrawlers? <laughs> because Starlink was that party game that you refused to bring anymore because uh, you didn't like it nearly as much as I did, where you have to draw, but you're drawing constellations. And so it was a great bomb to me who can't draw to save his life anyway. So that was that I enjoyed I've, that aspect. I've kept it. I do enjoy it. Oh, good. I think it's a neat concept. But I feel I'm, like you said, you have to, you know, draw something, but in the confines of the precisely. It's a great. Yeah. It's a great leveler. I think that that makes it more uh, accessible as well, even in the sense of accessibility. I think that for people with uh, some degree of uh, cognitive impairment and or even palsy, I think that that would that would make it uh, accessible. Certainly, in a way that a lot of other drawing games aren't. And I I still have dungeon scrollers. <laughs> I love Dungeon Scrollers so much. Connect the Dots was the thing I was able to do as a child. Yes, I had an unenlightening and unenlightened childhood. Staying within the lines and connecting the dots. Yes. That is Dungeon Scrollers. I got to play a game that you turned me on to, Much That Is Good and All That Is Evil, which turns out is a solo role-playing game. I didn't know that uh, going in, but the beta was re- was announced by the author Jiyun Shim, and it is available for free on their Patreon, Jion Shim Games. And it is a role-playing game where you play a Western... Goal. That's the thing. It's <laughs> <laughs> it, One of the initial choices is, do you identify a type of creature as a seagull? And if so, that identifies you as an urban individual. Anyway, it's a game about the Western gull. Much that is good and all that is evil is actually a quote, a scholar identifying traits of the rapacious individual. And essentially what you have is a somewhat dice-driven, occasionally you roll skill checks, but they're largely perfunctory. It's an excuse to string together writing about what it's like to be a gull. And it's an excuse to try to imagine, in the way that single-player games tend to be, trying to put yourself in the position of another character. It's sort of a a character study. And there is no writing prompts. Many of the solo RPGs that I've played in the past, such as The Wretched, are, give you writing prompts and encourage you to keep a journal of what's going on. Here, the emphasis is very much on, on the writing of the author, Jiyun Shim. And it's great. It's consistently enjoyable and kind of satirical. Here's, here's a direct quote from something that happens in the game. Because there were many, many great moments. But I, I don't want to repeat them all. But this is a great one. You see that they dropped their precious food in alarm. And now sadly, pathetically, are trying to salvage what they can. A single tear rolls down their cheek and catches the light like a prism. You feel good about yourself. I like that. That speaks to me on a fundamental level. I have an early memory in, in kindergarten of biting a child and then their their tears making me feel good. 
the fundamental cruelty of human. Ca- Nothing. I w- look. It's okay. <laughs> This is okay, Mark. No. This is a <laughs> this is something that I think that far too few people are willing to acknowledge. That insofar as we have a receptive capability that we typically call empathy, the reverse is also true. We are able to derive pleasure from the suffering of others. Now, not always, and generally speaking, you grow out of it on a, on a regular basis. But Schadenfreude exists for a reason, as a term. Anyway, moving on. Much that is good and all that is evil was thoroughly enjoyable. I suggest you go check it out. It will cost you nothing. Uh, It is meant to be read from a screen, so just check it out on your PC or tablet. All you need is a D6, and you're off to the races. Much that is good and all that is evil. Mark, we streamed, or I streamed, Wonderland's War. This is by Tim Elsner, Ben Elsner, and Ian Moss, and put out by Druid City Games. It is a bag builder. It is a press your luck. It is an... I don't even want to call it an area majority. It isn't really in a way, but it is troops on a map. And you're going around the tea table. You are, uh, that allows you to put meeples out on the map. It allows you to put chips in your bag. It gives you special abilities, Wonderlarians. It also gives you more quests to do. The game is slightly longer than it needs to be, but, but, but worth it, but worth it. It is just really fun. It really, this game once again showed that in my past life, I did something terrible. It was first draw of the game was the double meeple kill using, oh, no. using, using the shield to put the double meeple, sh- which you pulled again, out, which I immediately pulled again right after. Oh no Walker. And then, and then the same thing in the next round, the first pull, I had oh. two troops in there and a full bag. Like I, I concentrated on just having tons of chips in my bag. So pull corruption Second draw, corruption. <laughs> it was painful to watch, <laughs> but Wonderland's War is always a treat. I'm slowly blinging it out more and more. Some stickers on the meeples. I don't even know what else I can do. I think that's it. I, I think, yeah, oh, I, I can get some paint. I can get the figures painted up. That'll be the next step maybe one day. Who I knows? suppose, yes. Yeah, Wonderland's War was a game that showed up in both of our top tens. And I was rather surprised at how high it ended up in my top ten. Not because I remember disliking it, but because I, 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 you know, I, I remember it being a little bit too long, and I remember some of the vicissitudes of luck occasionally, very occasionally, uh, rendering you kneecapped in, in very much the way that you described. And for a game that's a little too long, that can sometimes be doubly unfortunate. But honestly, the way the different subsystems of the game work together and the novel take on push your luck is just so well done and then the production value right just yes that much higher even even the retail version i dare say i've never played the retail version but i don't i don't know that you need to spring for the additional element of the chips just the artwork alone i think does a great job of communicating the theme the lovely player boards the madcap style of the art which is appropriate given how it's alice in wonderland themed vaguely so yes, I'm, I'm I'm glad you were able to get it to the table again. It's it's definitely something that is worth playing. On the topic of something that showed up on both of our top tens, we also played Mosaic: A Story of Civilization, which similarly placed relatively high in both of our lists. Honestly, this game in particular, the session of Mosaic, I felt so firmly pulled in so many different directions. There were cards or actions that I literally felt like I was going to take next half the game. I'm not exaggerating. But it's just, I had these nesting conditionals of, wait, uh, uh, I want to do that other thing first. You compared it to another game where it's about efficiency and, well, I feel like I need to do A before B, but now I feel I need to do C before A. Scythe. Exactly. So there was that. There was that problem, the I want to do things in the most efficient order possible problem. But then there was also new toys coming up that would That's get right. distracted. It's like, all right, I know what I'm going to buy next. What I'm going to do is, ooh, look at that. <laughs> yeah, and it's not so much that you need it. It's like... I just can't let that guy have that. Yes. There were a number of cards that came up where I knew that somebody else couldn't take it and they had to take it because they knew I wanted it. It was great. I really think that Mosaic does a great job of leveraging very, very, very simple, short, snappy turns where you're not really drowning in toys the same way that, where there's heavy asymmetry, but they're just toyetic enough. Well, not actually toyetic. Toyetic is a specific term that refers to, you know, having the physicality of a toy. But anyway, they're just enough of a toy that they're pleasant to have and nice endorphin hits and you're constantly doing pleasant actions. It's not quite as quick and snappy as, say, a game of Matt Gertz, for example, but nonetheless, it has more character 
in terms of the different effects that get triggered. And the level of the, the big question that you often see on the board game geek four, I see this all the time in the mosaic, mosaic form. How much does it feel like a civilization game? And the, my answer is not much, but just enough. I mean, the mechanisms and the pleasure of drafting all these different cards and trying to build together a tableau, which isn't really an engine, but sometimes has vaguely engine-like elements, is eminently satisfying by itself. And the veneer of civilization-ness is just enough to keep it, keep it going. And I had a great time with Mosaic. This was a review copy we got from the publisher. And I'm looking forward to more content for Mosaic. I'm also looking forward to getting it to the table again. This, this too, is another game from 2022 that I think we should, we should work to keep in the rotation. Like Wonderland's War, it's a massive box, so it's not exactly something you can toss into the old game bag on a whim, but it is relatively easy to teach, good for large player counts, and moves along in a great clip, and so I think there is definitely uh, a solid niche for further games of Mosaic, A Story of Civilization. Yeah, and the fact that the end of game triggers, or the scoring triggers, is was played such a relevant role in this game that we played just recently. Absolutely. Because you can't sort of gauge it or... or Math right. it out. You, you can you can be sort of ready for it, but then it will quickly drip away. You know, like, <laughs> exactly. Say, okay, it's probably going to come this turn. I'm going to do all this, and then it doesn't come, and then you're like, well, okay, I'm going to do this instead. <laughs> because it's all in the decks of cards. There's going to be a scoring card come up, of which there's three that are going to randomly pop up, and that's going to trigger the end of the game. Some other things might trigger the end of the game, but usually, I think, always, this has been the way it's done. Uh, Maybe no, we, once for us. We, we've, had, we've had at least one session where pile exhaustion was the trigger. It depends on player count. The more players you have, the more likely it's the case that deck exhaustion is going to going to get you. If you have fewer players than tile exhaustion, the ones that give you bonuses for having six of a given symbol or for meeting certain milestones. Yeah, and like I said, so the triggers took people by surprise, and that's what I like about the game. You can't have this huge sort of build up where one person can, you know, exactly. control the whole map. And I really enjoyed that. Unlike, and again, we both like Scythe a great deal. In Scythe, you have a solid dozen turns that you can just plot out by yourself before anyone starts messing with you. External pressures in Mosaic are such that you're constantly having to worry, and so you must be making the less efficient suboptimal move because you cannot plan to be sure to have an uninterrupted series of turns just to be left by yourself. So that's Mosaic Story of Civilization, designed by Glenn Drover, put up by Forbidden Games. We played an upcoming game called Pax Ragnarok. Now, do you have to have like a license to put out a Pax game, or can anyone put out a Pax game? Can I go like, put Pax Tiddlywinks out next week? Or <laughs> uh, Pax is not a uh, copywritten term. Uh, several different companies have now put out Pax games. Although my understanding is that Pax Ragnarok is just a working title, and it is going to be renamed. And this is probably a good idea because it doesn't feel very much like a Pax game. It is not a tableau builder where the tableau builds a sort of engine that then powers your your map actions. Although I will say that the interface between the card play and the board is vaguely reminiscent of a Pax game. But please do go on. I was thinking maybe they call. It, I was thinking they called it like a Pax game because of sort of like the card offering was this you know sort of running theme in Pax games. But it's true you do draft cards from a central display, but that too it's done differently. And in you don't have to pay currency in Pax Ragnarok at the start of every turn. You take a card, and it's this tiled display where as you take cards, some cards become uncovered and then flip up and become available. Remind me a lot of Asgard's Chosen, in ways that it was sort of like a you know. Uh, mythology type game and had odd map presence that you sort of had to, you know, be ready for scoring and, and, Fair enough. and cards. And I didn't say an exact copy of it, but it, sure. just, it gave me that feeling of same sort of things. You're, you're drafting these interesting cards. You have this weird map presence where you're trying to get, you know, uh, area of majority and, uh, you get to transform your guys into, into faded know, warriors, faded warriors. You like, merge these two things together and they become more powerful and it's and yet another game that's all about timing oh yes when something's going to happen then uh, ragnarok happens different ways and then a lot of things die oh yeah faded are left and then you sort of debase the game it's like you start <laughs> everything yep everything gives you a turn so you destroy this card you destroy this unit you 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 know this token that you got you said you throw it away that gives you another turn 
All of these things are interesting. Looking forward to the final product. This was sent to us by the designer, John Moffat. Again, this is a pre-production prototype. A lot of details are apt to change. Some of the elements of iconography were a bit rough. Some of the graphic design elements were rough. The core of the game, though, was, I think, the best thematic rendition of Ragnarok since Blood Rage, and much, much better than Blood Rage. Most games about North Norse mythology, they give a head nod to Ragnarok. I mean, even Asgard's Chosen, one of my favorite Norse mythology games, is like, you're competing for who will survive Ragnarok, kind of, sort of, but eh, not really. What happens in Pax Ragnarok is, at a certain point, uh, largely by virtue of either map presence or running out of cards, Ragnarok happens and most of your pieces disappear. The only mortals that remain are these so-called faded mortals, the one in whom the Norns or the gods or some other forces have vested a certain importance. And suddenly the map is incredibly sparse. And again, where, where you thought you had a lot of time to get things done, suddenly you don't. <laughs> Every turn is painful. Everything is just difficult because there's so little round as you might expect in the end of the world. And there's lots of great thematic flourishes. Fenrir gets pride of place, which he absolutely should. Fenrir, if Fenrir was loose when Ragnarok happened, Fenrir just swallows a ninth of the board and it just goes away. Obviously, there are lots of cards representing all your all the greatest hits of North Mytholo Norse mythology and some of even the, the deep cuts. Uh, Tyr is woefully underpowered. I mean, I think whoever plays Tyr should just win the game automatically. You just play the card and just keep taking actions until you say you're done, and then I mean, ob it, it, obviously, it's a serious, it's a serious design problem. But moving on, I was keen to try Pax Ragnarok because I've been paying attention to its development on Twitter, and uh, the designer was kind enough to to send us a copy, and now I'm very, very curious to to see what happens with it. It is probably going to be published by Stone Circle Games because John Moffat uh, is a co-founder of Stone Circle Games. They previously published a number of titles, including Battle for Baturnia, and. I want to see where it goes. I, I hope the card balance is tightened up. I hope some of the, some of the uh, graphical elements are tightened up. But the core element, as I say, that switch from pre-Ragnarok to post-Ragnarok is fascinating. And now having seen how, I mean, pardon the pun, cataclysmic Ragnarok is, I think going into a second play will have a better sense of how to prepare for it and how much the first part of the game is just preparation for this calamitous event that strips you of most of your options. So you want to build up the right set of cards. You want to build up the right kind of board presence. You want to build up the right kind of resources overall to be able to weather it. So I, I think this is very promising. The only downside is it's a two-player only game, which is somewhat difficult. And a lot of PAX games are regarded as best at two, but... Uh, nonetheless, they have the, 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 the multiplayer element built in. And then again, there are the PAX games that are better with more. PAX Palmer, for example, is widely regarded as, as, as best with three or four. And so, I, as I say, I'm very optimistic for the future of PAX Ragnarok, whatever it ends up being called. Uh, just don't expect a traditional PAX game. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised if you're enthusiastic about the subject matter. Again, this is by John Moffat, yet to be published. Played another game of Street Masters, this time focusing on Street Masters Twin Tiger. Twin Tiger was one of the expansions that was released during the first wave of Street Masters. And on the one hand, I love it. On the other hand, I hate it. I love it because it is explicitly the Double Dragon expansion. It has the two brothers that dress the same, except in different colors. This time it's the designer insertions, but it's okay because it doesn't. The, the artwork doesn't scream real person insertion. It only whispers it gently into your ear seductively. And the enemy types are all ripoffs from Double Dragon. Double Dragon being a side-scrolling beat-em-up and Street Masters being the board game adaptation of side-scrolling beat-em-ups. The reason why I hate Twin Tigers, though, was because in the first wave of Street Masters, we've talked about this before, a lot of the art had unfortunate representations of women, and I, I personally feel that Twin Tigers is kind of the nadir of that particular problem. Subsequent waves of Street Masters content were much, much better. The Sadler brothers attribute this to them, exerting a greater degree of editorial control over the artists, and so I applaud that development. What I don't applaud is what has happened to Blacklist games over the course of the past couple of years, I could honestly, ev almost every week, do a new segment on a new way in which the current leadership of Blacklist Games has borderline or outright lied to people that it owes large amounts of product to. But quite frankly, at this point, why beat the dead horse? Suffice to say that Blacklist Games, now bereft of bo both Brady Sadler and Adam Sadler, is a shell of what it once was. They're not going to see any money from me ever again, and it's a shame because I really love Street Masters. Going back to Street Masters, it's one of those designs, almost everyone in the local group loves it. We love trying the variety. We haven't even scratched the surface of all the content that's available, and the different characters really do play very differently from each other in a satisfying way. 
And it's just a lovely little throwback to a video game genre and a style of co-op that we very, very much enjoy playing. I'm saying, what an ironic name of a company. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! So that was Street Masters, specifically Twin Tiger. And finally for me, played another few games of the crew, Mission Deep Sea. And I've come to the conclusion that Mission Deep Sea is my preferred way to crew. I think in part because you can just pick an arbitrary difficulty number and go to town and in so doing have more variety from that simple setup than even the variety present in the original crew's set of missions. Because in the original crew, you, you in theory, you were supposed to go through and, and follow some mission structure. So where do you start with new players? Not really with one because they're kind of training missions. And so it has a number of those difficult campaign questions to solve. And then they would have some weird, weird variability, like, oh, well, no communication in this one or what have you. And it would sometimes interface strangely with the set of objectives in that mission. But all the objectives were basically the same. Win this card in, in your trick. But the crew mission Deep Sea just explodes the range of things you might be expected to do on a given game. And I really find that I haven't even cracked open the mission book. I haven't felt the need. I, and even then, I've had so much more variety in terms of the goals to be accomplished in, in Mission Deep Sea. Just because if you look at the history of, of hobbyist trick-taking games over the course of you know any given stretch of time, you'll see that a lot of them expect you to do lots of different kinds of things. Win tricks in certain ways. Don't win tricks in certain ways. Make sure that other people win tricks in certain ways. And I, I really appreciate the fact that Mission Deep Sea has leveraged a lot of that in their really quite varied mission deck. And so if you liked the crew but found it a bit repetitive... Uh, which I think would be hard to do because even even the base crew is great. Uh, I'd suggest Mission Deep Sea. But if you and if you love the crew but would like more variety, well then get Mission Deep Sea as well. It's a brilliant co-op game that nonetheless manages to leverage a lot of widely understood things about trick taking. I won't go quite so far as my co-host to say if you've learned one trick taking game, you've actually learned a thousand. But it is absolutely an approachable game. No, oh, I say it gives you a good base to learn the rest. That that doesn't sound like something you'd say. I don't think okay. we might have to check the record on this one. I will. I'll get okay. some. I'll get a sound clip set up. You get the Gibbons on it. Yeah, yeah, the Gibbons will get on that. So another a joyous session with the crew. Mission Deep Sea and play for five minutes. Play for two hours. Whatever you want. Yeah, you go up in difficulty. You lose a couple times. Go back down. Love absolutely, it. absolutely. And those were the games we played. This week. Now, on to the news and why it does not matter. I've talked in the past of Zoe Allred's game Persuasion, and we got some update this week from Whirly Gig Games about work games they're working on, and it turns out that Persuasion is one of the designs that they are working on developing. Now, there's no word necessarily on whether Whirly Gig plans to publish the game, but they're currently in discussions with the designer Zoe Allred about how they could, about ways they could publish it in terms of the physical design, because one of the things that I didn't stress in my previous discussions of Persuasion, which is a game that I absolutely adore, a game about Jane Austen-style matchmaking and correspondence, is the way that the correspondence works actually leverages card sleeves because it is a print-and-play game, and when you print-and-play games, you work with card sleeves. And so there are now discussions about letterboxes and stamps and other things about how to do this. Anyway, I am very enthusiastic because I think that Persuasion deserves as broad an audience as possible. It is a wonderful game that has fascinating power and social dynamics, and therefore it is worthy of being in the Jane Austen tradition because far too many Jane Austen games don't do interesting things with social and power dynamics, which is kind of an insult to the author. And it was a wonderful game, and I, I want more people to be able to play it. So, Zoe Allred's Game Persuasion might be getting published sometime in the near future, but at the very least, it is being worked on, and that, I think, is a good thing. So we enjoy Quartermaster General games. Quartermaster General East Front by Ares Games is going to be coming out very soon. Another two-player Quartermaster General game. No, this is the first two-player Quartermaster General game. Did it not come out before? Did we talked about a two-player Quartermaster General game. No. Cold War is three. Victory Death is four. World War One is five. World War Two is six. Maybe it's a three-player game I was thinking of. All right. Like I said, looking forward to giving it a try. All of the other games were very interesting. All very good, pretty well. Especially World War Two Quartermaster General. Yeah, I've I've loved all of them except for the Cold War uh, for a variety of reasons. We reviewed it for a variety of reasons. We didn't enjoy it nearly as much. But Ian Brody is a fascinating designer, and I'll happily try almost anything he does. I say almost anything because I have not tried his War of the Ring card game. I was about to say not the Lord <laughs> of the Rings version yet. No. Yeah, just I mean, I, I, I'd play it, but I'm not yeah. going to go and find it. I just... On the topic of Jane Austen games, 
There's a game on Kickstarter that I've pledged exclusively because of what it is called. Now, in part, this is because it is one of those delightful Kickstarters that's a print-and-play project. They want five bucks, and they'll send you a PDF right after the campaign is done. Quite frankly, for me, I am more than happy to pledge on those on Impulse. Pride and Prejudice. Do you get it, Walker? Oh, my Lord. Do you get it? It's a roll and write. It's a roll and write about Pride and Prejudice, and it's called Pride and Prejudice. How are you not charmed? Are you dead inside? Yes. Is there something wrong with your soul? Roll and write How are you unmoved? Slowly killing me. Uh, yes, fair enough. I'm happy to make an exception in this case, though, for Pride and Prejudice, currently on Kickstarter. Mark, I often get touched by nostalgia when I look for news items. I see this new miniature system or an updated miniature system, and they show me the rank-and-file troops. So this time it's Hail Caesar, the second edition rulebook. This is by Warlord Games, and they had these ranks of Roman soldiers fighting the Gauls, and it's like, ah, you know... Maybe this is the one. Have, you, I, ever, I... have you ever done Mass Battle Historical? No. Oh, okay. That, well, back in the like the, the first club I joined was the uh, Kingston War Gamers Association. Yep. They did tons of Napoleonics. Sure. But didn't play much with them there. You didn't inhale. I did not inhale yep. of the vapors. It was mostly magic there and a little mm. bit of board games, lots of 40K and Warhammer. Right. But not so much Napoleonics. Yeah, because I got, I got my start in hobby gaming with Mass Battle Napoleonics back in the day. I just didn't know if you ever had. No, we we did play some. We there's uh, there's one gentleman that had a Zulu game that was fantastic. Oh, okay. So we did a lot of that. Great news in the mass market. Kabuto Sumo, a delightfully awesome game, is now going to get a mass market version at Target called Kabuto Sumo Beetle Brawl, and this is going to be a somewhat stripped down version. Fewer wrestlers available, but nonetheless, it's going to retain the core awesome pushing gameplay and asymmetric beetle wrestlers that made Kabuto Sumo so enjoyable. So look for Kabuto Sumo Beetle Brawl at Target. And I got to say, the Target game aisle is uh, it's looking it's pretty good. pretty damn good. Yeah. I hope they, they should do the same thing as uh, Spirit Island did. Just make put ran, like new wrestlers in there. Oh, wow. Maybe not as many, but just different ones. And then that will just... Don't give them that idea. It's only There are only so many games from Target that I want to be... Like, I did it for Jaws of the Lion. I did it for Spirit Island Horizons. I don't want to have to do it more. They're in it for... I'm not going to say they're in it for the money. They're in it for the money. No, of so course they are. I'm saying, look, it would be good for them. It would be bad for me. It would be bad for us. <laughs> Lastly, for me, we like 51st State Master Set, Mark. Yes. Not so much Imperial Settlers, no. but now there is a game called Imperial Miners. It's incorporating some of the mechanics and one that I thought was interesting where uh, where you put the cards, they combo off of each other. I thought that would be interesting. So sort of the 51st state, but where you place the cards is going huh. to matter. So that seems a little interesting. You're miners, dwarven miners, and you're mining. There are six different factions right in the box. Looking forward to- Six different factions of dwarves? That seems like six too many. That's a lot of dwarves. Yeah, it's a fair number. But it is what it is. Maybe there'll be other things other than dwarves. Who knows? I should hope so. One could hope. I don't know. A lot of games are dwarf only. The Clank games are dwarf only. Saboteurs is dwarf only. There are a lot of games. People Caverna. like dwarves. Caverna. Yeah, well, Caverna until the most excellent first expansion, which finally liberates you from the shackles of dwarf only existence. That's true. Sorry, I should, I should specify I'm talking about fantasy dwarves, not human dwarves. Just so. There's going to be a new edition of Acquire from Renegade Games. Acquire, the venerable game from the 1960s of Sid, Sid Saxon of property acquisition, is going to get a new edition. I find the new editions fascinating from a physical perspective. They have ranged all the way from simple cardboard chits on a cardboard board to the ridiculous Avalon Hill version of the 90s with plastic molded hotels on top of a giant plastic board. I'm very curious to see what Renegade Games is going to do with it. Acquire is an undeniable classic. Hobby gamers that care about the history of the hobby, that's only if you care about the history of the hobby, should absolutely try it. I'm not, this is not gatekeeping. I'm not saying if you haven't tried to acquire, you're not a real gamer. I'm just saying if you're curious about the history of the hobby, you should look at the works of Sid Saxon. Uh, it's not m my cup of tea necessarily. Uh, I much prefer Reiner Knizia's riff on the on similar ideas as represented in games like Stevenson's Rocket. But I am glad that it is going to be back in print so that new people can get exposed to it. Yeah, if if you want to feel what a six year old game feels like, then, uh, <laughs> then definitely okay, you'll get that okay, from okay, fire. okay, okay. <laughs> Most games that feel their age do so because they're clunky and overlong. 
right? Acquire is not neither of those things. It's, it's true. It is not clunky. It is not overlong. It is, however, arbitrary. You will feel its age. Yes, that that I think is fair. And then finally for me, I find this interesting at a number of levels. There's going to be a pseudo-sequel to Scythe from Stonemeyer Games. I'm sure a lot of people have seen this, called Expeditions. Here's the thing that I find curious. This is just an observation about things. No judgment involved. I find this an interesting uh, uh, study in how different people weather crises and scandals, right? So if you take a look at what happened with Daniela Tashini, there was recriminations and counter-recriminations and then a moment of pause and then acknowledgement and and an acknowledgement of learning and company statements about training and so forth. And then there's uh, Jacob Rosalski. If you remember Jacob Rosalski a few years ago, there was a controversy where it was discovered that his art had been traced in large part unattributed from other, other works and like directly traced. No variation whatsoever. And uh, basically the response was, uh, screw you, this is what art is. And I'm just curious to see if, once again, using the art of Jacob Rosalski, some of the same pieces, some of the same pieces that were even leveraged in the accusations of tracing are going to find their way into expeditions. And uh, so far, I haven't seen any comment about it. I, I think they, they probably just use the AI generator. You just have to type in <laughs> pictures based on the Scythe board game <laughs> under this artist's style. And sure. Then, and then done. And then... So the snake eats its own tail. Exactly, and yeah. Jacob Rosalski gets uploaded to the net and... Just so. Okay. Anyway. So that is the news and why it doesn't matter. And now we go on to our feature game, which is Rolling Heights. Rolling Heights was designed by John D. Clare, uh, fulfilled pretty much in January of 2023. John D. Clare has published many games. Uh, some of his greatest hits include Myth- Mystic Veil, vale, which I believe was the first game that brought him onto uh, hobbyist attention. Space Base, Edge of... <clears throat> sorry, I had a little something stuck in my throat. Ed- Edge of... <clears throat> sorry, this is... Very embarrassing. Yeah. <clears throat> Edge of Darkness. <clears throat> Cubitos and Dead Reckoning. So, Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary about what one does in Rolling Heights? Well, in Rolling Heights, you're building this great city, and then you're debating whether or not it was such a great idea to build over those plant those banana plantations. <laughs> the locals, the locals, they seem very worked up about something, something to do with the local wildlife. I'm sure it's fine, no problem. <laughs> They're all leaving town. I'm sure that's just a festival or something to go to. Everything's <laughs> fine. We're all fine here. Okay, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> all right, so you have these sort of re- resources dropping out of a chute. All sorts of different resources. And, and you need to have the right blocks to put them in the right spots. And so you're sort of, you know, wood falls down and you want to have places to put this wood and the concrete and the steel. And so you're you're trying to mass these buildings and making sure the blocks that are falling down have somewhere to go. Otherwise you're being suboptimal. <laughs> and then and then it leads to all sorts of of decision spaces where you can start to modify the blocks that are dropping down and you get to have more places to put the blocks and more reasons to put the blocks in certain spaces. All of this is Rolling Heights. So Rolling Heights is a tiling city building game for one to four players. And I think that Walker is right to highlight the central resource challenge. It's it's uh, telling that you actually mentioned 51st State Master Set in the context of this episode, because that's one of the things that makes that game work. 51st State Master Set, to a large extent, works because you cannot stockpile resources from turn to turn. If you could, I would argue the game would be much, much less interesting. And I, I know that the, it, that was not its key innovation. I know that Imperial Settlers worked the same way. Thank you very much. In Rolling Heights, you cannot save your resources from turn to turn, and your resources that you get every turn will be semi somewhat random. We'll get to that in just a moment, I have no doubt. And so as a consequence, you need to have tiles under construction that can use the resources you produce. And that calibration, making sure that your resource needs and your resource outputs and your resource inputs match or at a rough equilibrium is one of the interesting challenges and trade-offs in Rolling Heights. And it is one of the most immediate pressures you find because very quickly in the game, you'll find yourself generating resources and realize, wait, uh, uh, I don't have a place to put glass. Uh Uh-oh. And so your purchasing decisions will be constantly pulled between what you'd like to build and what you can build more immediately. And that I find uh, a delightful set of tensions and trade-offs. Yeah. And the, the final outcome is this very interesting looking city. Like you said, the, the, the output is not always wasted because it's that same output that you're going to be using to to put sort of blueprints out on the map for what you're building. And you have these two large sort of 
decks that you can, what, are, what would you call them? Stacks of tiles. Stacks of tiles or offerings on either side, level one and two. So you have this, you know, graduated sort of, you know, they get more expensive as they go up the tracks and you use those to put them on the map. You're sort of restricted about how far you can go from it already started your, your first project. So very interesting things there. Yeah, but it's not trivial to just buy a new tile. For one thing, you're limited to one purchase a turn, which I think is good. It minimizes downtime, and it also means that there's uh, less slack in the resource manipulation. You can also convert resources to different resources, but that too is suboptimal and doesn't feel like a good trade to be doing on the reg, and it's a great way to make sure that other people will be building much much faster than you are. And it's also the case that if you just end up building randomly new tiles, that is, not completing ones you already have, then that is off, often a great way to feed extra points to your opponents because whenever you buy a tile, if it's not the cheapest one, it's going to give these very valuable wild tokens on other bits of property. And so you have to be careful with your purchases. If you didn't have to be careful with your purchases, if you could just buy anything you wanted, however you wanted, well, then yes, you wouldn't feel this pressure to calibrate your economy properly. And then I think the game would be much less good. As it is, this early game tension, I much prefer the early game to the later game because in the early game, you're, well, maybe more like the early mid game because in the very early game, everyone's got the same four meeples that generate the same resources. And there's this pressure to ramp up your economy, get more meeples because you can throw up to 10. So getting those first two or three meeples is I think when the game really kicks into high gear for me, because in rolling heights, that pressure to get to 10, once you're past 10 and calibrating, which 10 you want to pitch eh, a little more straightforward, a little less interesting, but that pressure to ramp up is part of what I really appreciate. And as you're doing that, as you're ramping up, you're diversifying your, your production, which further puts pressure on your ability to use that production efficiently. Yeah. And there's other guides to tell you what buildings to get, right? Because there are three random projects or uh, sort of ads at the, at the thing that are random every game. And you also are dealt two targets. And I like the mechanism where you get to hold on to both for the whole game and then choose which one of those two you're going to score. Yeah. Why, why so often in games like this, are you given these end game goals and then sh told to choose at the beginning, especially for first plays, especially when the game is relatively light, rolling heights is relatively light. Why make you commit from the outset? It makes so much more sense to me to do it the way rolling heights does it. You hold on to both and score whichever one you want at the end of the game. Yeah. So that's putting buildings in columns, having certain buildings next to each other. And there's also bonuses on the board, putting certain buildings in spots. So there you have a little bit of guidance and I really like how everything is just, sort of what you've rolled with your meeples. It's, there's no other currency, you know, you use this currency to do that and this and everything in the game is just that one currency. Well, let's talk about That's that then. Say. Yeah. So it's called Rolling Heights. It is called Rolling Heights because what you do with your meeples is you roll them. That's the big gimmick. It's kind of the, I think, I think, I dare say to use a Walker term, it's the hook. It is the hook. It was very prominently advertised on the crowdfunding page. It's like, ooh, you're rolling your meeples. Now, a small number of games have already done this. Uh, Walker, you're a fan of the rolling of the meeples. I love rolling. I love something quirky like that is always neat. So you you roll them. They, it comes with uh, two boxes, which split out for the four players. You roll them in, and either they're on their back, which means they're exhausted, or they're on their side or head, or you know anything but you know on their feet, standing up yeah. some way, but not on their feet is working steady. And then if they're actually perfectly standing on their feet, then they're going to be working hard. And it's the same for all the different nine colors of meeples that you're rolling. You get two points of action if they're standing up, one point of action if they're on their side, and nothing if they're exhausted. And so you roll your initial roll, and as long as you have, and you keep rolling until you have 50% of them something, not exhausted, and then you can start risking. And you get to roll, and if they're all exhausted, then you've blown it, they're on strike. And uh, luckily you get one of these uh, bonus tokens that we've already talked about, which is a wild, a wild... Uh, Resource. Resource, but then you have to lose half of your active meeples. Yes. <laughs> like Cubitos. Yes, it's very much like Cubitos. It has that same element of push your luck. And uh, it, it very much like Cubitos, it is seldom in your interest to bother. Uh, but nonetheless, it is a it is a decision point to be done. The, reason, the only reason why I object to it, and it, it's a mild objection, is because they're just awkward to manipulate. I would have much preferred custom dice or some other randomization metric because you've got these these little trays and it's great that the trays are there. If the trays weren't there, oh, that'd be terrible. But you've got these little trays into which you pitch your meeples and overwhelmingly, the predominant result is they're lying on their face. 
Like, just look at a meeple and figure out, figure out about how frequently it's going to be on its feet or on its side versus its face, just based on the surface area. You're correct. Your intuition that most of the time it'll be on their face, you're correct. What that means is you're spending a lot of your time in a game of Rolling Heights pitching your meeples in the box, prying them out of the box, or scooping them out or dumping them into your hand, pitching them over and over and over again. Yeah, but this is happening while other people are playing. I've it never, doesn't lead I've to never... downtime. I'm just saying yes. it's physically well, unpleasant. I, I just want to make sure <laughs> yes. that was clear. But I think it leads m- more into the theme, more into funny comments. Does it? How... I think so, because they're the actual workers and they're tired. Or I they're, guess. They're okay. working hard. And it leads into the you know the comments of, you know, these guys are crazy and they go to these... These, these workers are lazy. And, and, oh, it's my, mostly just anti-labor my, sentiment my that gets still, expressed. Yeah. My steel my workers, workers are, refuse are, to are, show up to work. Or yes. killing it. Look at that. You have four steel turns <laughs> every turn they come to work. Stuff like that I find is kind of interesting. I, I think it is a pointless gimmick that makes the game less usable. Honestly, I just find it physically unpleasant to... You have my ten meeples and pitch them four or five times before I'm actually at the decision point. I would have much preferred some sort of simple dice mechanism. I don't know how the the odds would have been calculated exactly, and it probably would have been a more expensive component. All right, so maybe this is just a marvelously cheap way. Although the meeples are are some of them are quite cute. They're, some of them are, are somewhat, somewhat translucent. They're shiny. They're represented by a little shiny in the graphic design. The graphic design overall is is very pleasant. It's by Quan Chai Moria, and I, I enjoy his work. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the gimmick of rolling the meeples does nothing for me. I would prefer it did something else. I would disagree. Like I said, there's nine different meeples. So you start off with ones that give you wood and concrete, and then you get other ones that give you all different sorts of resources, ones that give you victory points, ones that give you uh, not building resources, like just sort of like... Yeah, resources resources. that can only be used either for conversion or for purchase. Those ones I find very interesting. I like those a lot. And ones that uh, motivate your workers, make them stand up. So all sorts of different things. And then, like Mark said earlier, and how you get these meeples is to build buildings. You'll see right on on the tile, it'll say, when you complete this building, you'll get a green meeple. And you'll add it to your pool. And then, like you said, the the up from... From four to five is huge for the 50% thing. Oh, yeah. And then once you get to 10, then you're rolling all sorts of meeples. And once you get above 10, you get to choose which one. So you're sort of, you know, customizing your roll. Interesting things start happening. Yeah, you start using your green meeple to stand up your purple meeple. Your purple meeple activates one of the buildings you built on a couple turns before, and that might give you the ability to do something else. Uh, this contributes, I think, to one of my minor misgivings. The downtime is a bit of a problem. So Rolling Heights is a relatively simple game. Some quality decision making to be had, but it's relatively simple, relatively quick, but the downtime can get a little painful, uh, even with three. With three or four, it's just a little bit longer than I would like, especially since there's a fair amount of manipulation to be done between turns. You have to readjust building tracks much of the time. It's one of those games where you really have to encourage all the players to say, I am done when they're done their turn, because otherwise it might not be evident. There's a couple ways I think this could have been benefited. I Like for just a minor petty issue, I, I would have liked it if the, the tracks for new tiles had had the, t- the tiles side to side. So you could just slide them down rather than having to pick up and move 10 different tiles yeah, every like time. Down the side of each board are your level one and two buildings. And then if someone picks, you know, out of order, then you, they have to sort of slide to, you know, fill the spaces, but they've spaced them all out. So there's like, yeah, just so the track could be the length of the board, yes. which I respect and understand, but I would have much preferred it if yes. it was a little... And you're moving each tile yeah. and you have to slide them instead of, like Mike like Mark said, just slide down the whole... And you're already place. spending a fair amount of time manip- just manipulating pieces just to manipulate pieces. Like, I'm adding two wood and a concrete to my buildings. Like, okay, well, my two wood's over here, my concrete's over here. You're already reaching over to cover vast uh, stretches. The element of, of fiddling around with the tiles when you don't have to is the one thing that kind of makes me think that eh, this, is, this is almost verging on fiddly, which for a game of this weight isn't isn't very good. But you alluded to this briefly before. Rolling Heights has one thing in its in its favor that I think is heads and shoulders above any other city building game I've ever played. The end result looks like a city. You get a skyline in this game, which is astounding. The first time I played Rolling Heights, I you know I was thinking, oh well, you know th- these economic trade offs are kind of cool and that's nice, and I'm laying down my tiles, and I look over. This was this was you know a few rounds into the game, uh, maybe half a dozen to a dozen buildings have been generated. I look over, I'm like, holy crap, this looks better than any silly building game I've ever seen, because you get to see there are these housing developments with 
Uh, you know, sometimes some low rise apartment buildings, they don't look like apartment buildings. I'm not going to exaggerate that, but we're talking about, you know, a couple of wood stacked on top of each other. And then a few blocks away, you've got a park, maybe a little bit of glass sprinkled in there. And then there's this high rise glittering structure built out of steel and glass that towers above everything else. It looks amazing and it's just effortless. Granted, you spend a little bit of time manipulating these pieces, but it's not like you spend a lot of time worrying about zoning restrictions and this, that, and the other. The game just organically encourages you to build something that looks like it has an interesting skyline, and that, I think, is a great achievement. I've been playing city-building board games for 20 years. I, don't, I, I honestly can't remember another one that holds a candle to this, graphically. I agree. It looks beautiful. I didn't find the downtime that bad, just because, one, you're rolling your meeples, Two, you're looking at all your sort of different areas where you've built and you have, you do have buildings that get bonuses for having other certain buildings around it, or you have, to, you have a chance to look at all your two targets that you need or the other achievements and then what buildings are available and where they should go. And by then it's your, it's, if it's not your turn, you, you get to see what meeples you have and what resources you're getting. And you can sort of, like I did in our last game, I have all my resources ready to go. I put them out. I, do what I need to do, and the next person is going. Not so everyone's I, as disciplined as you are, Walker. Well, and we had a new player <laughs> that you know wasn't quite sure what was moving on. I think it seemed a little more evident in in our last plane that there, you know, there was a little sort of speed bump as it went I, around. I was actually surprised at I was I was girding myself because even with three, I had felt that the downtime was three players. Everyone had played before. Even with that, I thought the downtime was a little bit more than I'd like, and so I thought four was going to be painful. I was actually pleasantly surprised by how little additional difficulty that posed. I'm just saying that all told, given given the depth and length of the game, I would prefer a little bit a little bit less downtime. Gotcha. But I do respect the fact that yes, there are ways to mitigate it. Honestly, the sort of uh, you know I, I joked about zoning considerations, and sure enough, like any other city building game, you're, you're going to play like Suburbia. Suburbia is probably one of the market leaders. You're going to have tiles that encourage you to do certain things, you know, like that industry tile that, because of a variety of elements on the map, has subtle encouragement it's to you to build away from other residential tiles. But honestly, like any other good set of trade-offs in Rolling Heights, that just gets added to your calculations. Sometimes it's a thing you need to build. Sometimes the placement is driven by other considerations. And so sometimes you do end up with a factory next next to a high school. It happens, but not as often as uh, you might think, given, again, a series of relatively low-complexity sets of incentives for you to build something that kind of sort of almost looks like a naturally zoned city. And these two stacks are huge. We've had multiple games of this, and there's always been one certain type of building that hardly ever comes out. Or yes. And in the next game, tons. Like two games ago, we had no civic buildings. Today, we had almost all civic buildings. Yep. We had very few houses. I like how- There's a lot of tile variety, yeah. Yeah. Lots of different ones. And they look great. And yeah. So- for me, Rolling Heights is, by not a small margin, my favorite John D. Clare game. I approach John D. Clare games with a certain amount of weariness. I've, the only game of his that I've strongly disliked is Edge of Darkness. Other than that, I just get this general sense of eh, whatever. And, but to his credit, they're usually pretty approachable games. They don't tend to wear out their welcome too much. Uh, Dead Reckoning might be a bit of an exception, and of course Edge of Darkness and a little bit too long. He doesn't tend to make things that are overwrought, suffice to say. Sometimes they're very derivative, like Space Base. Sometimes they're just sort of, I find, on autopilot, like Mystic Veil. Vale. But I, I suffice to say, I haven't really had one that clicked. Cubitos, I thought was cute. I enjoyed Cubitos for a few plays. I thought it was all right. Uh, but Rolling Heights, I thoroughly enjoy. I think it is a great light little mate, bu uh, middleweight building game. It looks spectacular when you've built your entire city. There's a sense of whimsy in the tiles. There are these subtle economic trade-offs pulling you in different directions. Uh, I thoroughly, I've thoroughly enjoyed Rolling Heights, and it quite surprised me. Yeah, and they have it. They they have it set out just perfect that when the game ends, like when one of the particular resources runs out, you'll do. Uh, finish that round and do one more and it seems to fill the map perfectly there's no you're never at a loss where to put a tile and then once once that whole round is complete and your city is completely set up then you're ready for the actual game yeah you see so it turns out this was all just set up you weren't really playing a game of rolling heights rolling heights begins once you've i mean nominally you've crowned a winner kind of sort of there's somebody with the most points but really that was a selection mechanism for who plays the monkey. Just so. 
Why don't you tell us about the angry ape, Walker? So, the angry ape comes because you have built over his banana plantations, and now he must destroy the city. So, the player who had the most points gets to play the ape. They stand up, and they hold this this giant monkey figure at arm's length, and they drop it down onto the city, trying to level it down so all the buildings are, you know, four, four cubes or lower, and they're slowly destroying the city. And then the normal players, <laughs> they're trying to stop the ape. And so when the once the, the ape players dropped their the ape, they must now stand it up on top of one of the, the buildings, and then the other players try to knock do the same thing at arm's length, standing up, drop a meeple, and try to knock the ape off the building. Crucially, while minimizing civilian casualties. Yeah, that's a great trade-off, right? Yeah. You're, you're knocking the ape off, but you're also destroying the building. So it sort of leads to interesting decisions for the ape. Does yeah. you know, hide on a small building where it's a little more stable and out of the way, or or put yourself on the highest building because you know it might cause collateral damage? And all the better to swipe at the passing biplanes. We first played Rolling Heights, and there were two bags of Kickstarter goodies. One of them just had more tiles. More tiles is fine. Well, I think we should go a little more into this. It was a, a seaside expansion. Yes. came with more seaside tiles. Yeah. But which had to go uh, adjacent to Some of which have water. to go adjacent to the water, And yes. to tell you this, they had this smallest yes. symbol on it, which we wish that was bigger. Yeah. Some of the, I, I suppose we should have mentioned, some of the iconography can be difficult to read. Uh, but overall, it's, it's yes. perfectly functional, and it's in service of a good-looking final product. So you know, some concessions have to be made. And the other bag had this 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 eight meeple. I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> and it really does feel as though I'm not suggesting this is this is reality, but it's almost as though John DeClaire designed this five to ten minute dexterity game where setup took about twenty minutes. <laughs> He's like, all right, what do I do with this? Okay, well, what if I made the setup a game? <laughs> And then he made this out of a game. So here you are, you play, and this, I think, honestly, is the best way to introduce it to new players. This is what we've, we've, we have done. You, you teach the game, you play the game, and then you make sure they don't start tearing it down yet. Like, all right, here's our city. Now someone's going to be playing as the ape, and the ape just shows up and just starts wrecking stuff. It's a little bit of a problem with pieces of plastic flying everywhere, but oh my goodness, it's worth it. It is by far the most delightful Kickstarter promo I have ever seen. Yes, even more than Fenrir. Angry Ape, better than Fenrir. Wow. Uh, look, in terms of the fact that it's a, the, the secondary dexterity game you get to play, you get to leverage the fact that you built this wonderful city with a skyline and then destroy it. For people who liked to play SimCity back in the day and then have an angry monster destroy your city, it's like that but a million times better because now it's a dexterity game. Just so. Absolutely wonderful. I checked the crowdfunding campaign very, very closely. They do not say it is Kickstarter exclusive. It was just a free mini game included. So I hope, I hope that this becomes available to everybody. Because honestly, this is the definitive way to play. It is weapons grade delightful. And honestly, it just t makes a great experience into an amazing one. Yeah, I'll play Rolling Heights anytime. Very easy to teach. Very, you know, the, the most complicated thing is the fact, like we said, there's nine different meeples and they do different things. Right. That is the extent of the difficulty. Rolling Heights. Here's the question, though. Would you play Rolling Heights without the Angry Ape? Uh, no. <laughs> Why would you do something? <laughs> I'm saying if you were to, con like, say you were on a desert it's, island. <laughs> it's now that, now that I know the Angry yeah. Ape exists. I, it's, it's just, it's incomplete without it. Honestly, it like, it flourishes like that. Make me love this hobby. I think Rolling Rolling Heights is a very good game with a lot of graphic innovation and component chops, and the Angry Ape bonus game is just it's why I why I'm in the hobby. I'm in the hobby to play with toys, and it is such a delight. Oh my goodness! <laughs> it's almost like it was made for us. There's not a, like a lot of people. This intersection of strategy gaming and dexterity gaming. A lot of people are there, but not everybody's there. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> so, that was Rolling Heights by John DeClaire and AEG. Thank you very, very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find all our contact information on sowronggames.com slash contact. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thank you so much for deciding to spend time with us. We hope to see you again soon. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bicking. 
Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoeseiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. Welcome to Masterpiece Theater, where today's film will be RRR. Not a pirate movie, just to make, just to be clear. I want to see a red coat suplexed by a leopard. Can I see a red coat suplexed by a leopard? 100%. Can you? Can Great. We, can we see the outlawed four armed man combat style? Oh, you mean the Beam Tour? <laughs> <laughs> the final Pokemon evolution of the two main characters forming the Beam Tour. The double. The double rifled beam tour. Oh, it's, I don't. I don't even. I don't even know what to say. I, I think. I think the way to put it is is as follows. RRR is the cinematic equivalent of crystal meth. <laughs> oh, I, as I say, Mark, when we, when we're talking, we have to not go too far. You know, we we sometimes when we talk about RRR, yeah, it, it ramps I, it's, up. It's true. I need to. We sleep. get a little excited. I need to sleep time sometime this week. Yeah, I think I went four days no sleep because we got so excited about. So, RRR last well, time. what happened was. Huey, at one point, we were talking about RRR, and Huey's like, what's what's about RRR? About five minutes later, we realized that I had my hands around his throat, and I was screaming right into his face about RRR. I was filming it, but not directly, in a reflection of water <laughs> through some... In slow-mo. In yeah, slow-mo. Yeah, in slow-mo yeah. yeah, so I could shake it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a lot. I mean... I had to watch it in like four or five different sittings. <laughs> now, granted, it's three hours, so there's going to be a lot of it. <laughs> but it's just, something would happen that was so incredibly gonzo, I'd have to pause or stop it and just get up and take a walk. Like, yeah. just, you can't, I couldn't process everything that was going on. Multiple singing numbers. Oh, giant, the musical numbers are great. Giant yeah. dance number. Yeah, yeah. Ridiculous combat scenes. Oh, there's a lot ridiculous. Some some incredibly uh, sweaty uh, men, glorious men. The two leads are gorgeous human beings. They, they They're very them. physically attractive. I'm, I'm confident with my sexuality to comment on how incredibly attractive I found them, especially are, Rom. Rom is a dreaming. beautiful man. Yes. Goodness gracious. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I where to start? I mean, I... Th- um, I think one thing that's important to stress for me, at least as, as, a, as a viewer, is I accept the fact that there is a mountain of cultural, historical, religious, uh, political context that I just don't know anything about. Yes. I know zero elements. And, and much like board games where, where I get very interested in, in the subject matter and I go when I watch videos, oh, sure. this, I want to go, I want to understand sure. what, was the, what was the song he was singing when he was being whipped to death. <laughs> and I'm not. I'm not trying to be super silly. I'm yeah, a yeah, yeah, silly, yeah, but yeah. Not super silly, and and uh, the imagery that they use, like I said, the the shots through reflection, yep, and, the, yep. and the different ways they shot things. There are reasons. The representations why they did of this. fire and water, and and yeah, all of those things. So, long story short, a young girl's been kidnapped. The, why, it, the protector. Why are you talking about plot? I mean, <laughs> the, well, just to set up set up the, the next person. So, the protector of that whole. Uh, the Gond people. The Gond people in that area of land is sets out to bring her back home. Then there is the soldier, and then the police officer. Then the, the police officer. The the British find out that this this man, this hero, is coming to get the girl. So they they enlist this this soldier from the area to stop him, hunt him down. So he's going throughout the lands with a pitcher. Trying no, to, no. Trying to find... a picture of some random dude. True. He, it's it, like that's one of the ridiculous things that happens in the movie. Look, it's an action movie. It's a big epic, right? It, it's it's long on feeling and short on detail. His big idea for finding out the rebel is why don't we find it where all the radicals chill out? And he just sits there with like narc printed on his forehead, and you see these lecturers at the front of the hall. I wasn't even going to bring this up. The lecturers at the front of the <laughs> hall is like, we must teach our children the value of independence. We must teach them the the fact that this is our land. And we will rise up eventually, and we will build up a resistance movement to the British. And he's like, why are we wasting our time? Why don't we just kill the governor? And then he looks around for reactions, and everyone gives him the side. And he's like, 
why don't you go sit in the corner, Narc McNark face? <laughs> like, showing the same degree of, of subtlety that the FBI did when trying to infiltrate quote-unquote mosque. Where, like, why don't we send them a bodybuilder who's like, yeah, jihad, 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 jihad. You want to, violent jihad? Violent jihad. And they're like, ah, thanks, Brother Frank. But we'll take a miss on that. And so some guy, but, but, show, no, no, hold but, on. But he was, but the, he fooled one guy. It's true. One guy shows up and he literally says, did you mean what you said? I've had a, my brother has had some difficulties. That's what he said. And he's like, sure, sure. Bring me to your brother. Dude runs away when he finds out he's a cop. And so then cop decides he must be the ringleader of all the rebels around here. Some gormless dude with a brother. So he w- starts wandering around the streets, showing everybody the picture of this dude, except his boyfriend. The one person he doesn't show this picture to is his deep, deep, deep boyfriend. It's true. <laughs> I, there is one scene which I which I I love. So there, so there, the one the one guy who who he fooled is going to say, "Let me take you to my my friend, our, yep. our group," and they get to a checkpoint. Yeah, it was pretty funny. <laughs> and so you know he goes up and, and you know was it, hey you play I, play I, it cool. I, I'm, yeah, a, I'm, just, a, I'm a cop. Just I'm just let officer. us through. Just yeah. yeah and then sort of the, he goes off and. <laughs> He confirms it, and he comes back, and he salutes. He salutes the undercover and cop. And he, goes, and he goes, he goes, he goes oh, <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. And then that's when the guy takes off, just the look on his face. Like, it was good. Oh. It, was, it was pretty good. It was pretty yeah. good. And then what follows is, of course, a, a, a chase scene. No, look, like, I mean, there, there's a billion. I mean, I, I joke that a leopard suplexes a red coat. This is literally a thing that happens. <laughs> and it is. I think the most crazy things that uh, the, the crazy thing that happens in the movie, but there's a mil- like any given five minutes, you're gonna see something astounding that you've never seen before yeah. in a movie. It's, it's like a four hour <laughs> epic. So long story short, the guy he's looking for, he pals around with for the whole movie, and then there's the conflict where you know they have they finally have to fight each other because involving one uh, involving uh, one of them throwing uh, a flaming chariot a flaming carriage at the other. Uh, he retaliates with uh, large hunting cats and a fire hose. But then it turns out that he's not Don't actually... Don't spoil it. Jeez. Oh, okay. I thought we were reviewing <laughs> this movie. We're not really doing all anything. Right, all right, all right. You can't review this. This movie is unreviewable. It's like a cinder block to the face. It's just... I mean, Look, and I, I just want to be uh, to be perfectly sincere. I realize that this movie is playing with some pretty heavy religious yes. and historical stuff. Yes. I, as I said, I have no views on these things because I'm literally ignorant. I've got no idea. I, but the two main characters are apparently very, very important national figures for well, yeah, Indian one nationalism. Is, one is a superstar uh, a Bollywood uh, actor. No, no. I mean the, the characters that oh, the they're characters portraying playing, historically. Yes. Yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. Oh, and then at the end. Oh, my goodness. But anyway, we'll get... <laughs> Um, you mean with the bow and arrow? Oh no, no, I meant, I meant, like, I meant the credits. Oh, the the the, the, the the extra dance scene. Yes, yeah, yeah, extra, yeah. Extra dance scene. See, what I like about that dance scene is uh, they're willing to acknowledge that there are other dancers in the world because in the first dance scene they're they're just dancing with each other. That was intense. <laughs> anyway, we could look. Oh, man. Long story short, <laughs> British are bad. Bad, bad, bad. Oh, look! If you're gonna take, if you're gonna pick villains, honestly, the British in India, circa twentieth century, pretty good targets. Yep. <laughs> so this all ends in a whirlwind, giant fight at the end. Won't reveal any of the big secrets. Oh, we'll, we'll leave some awesomeness. Like it's just the riot scene. The riot scene is amazing. It is amazing. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I guess we can break that down. So they have twenty minute. Introduction, character introduction. Yes, scenes, right. Yeah. So we have the fire guy. He does this, you know, crazy mob that there's he he there's single handedly huge, puts down a riot yeah, of this, thousands of people. This huge riot is pushing against the gates, and from the from the <laughs> back, this this one memorable person throws a rock. The one guy not wearing white or brown. And, yeah, and he breaks the picture of of the. He of shatters the, king. the glass of the photo of the king. And, and, and the, and the <laughs> officer goes. Arrest, Arrest that, that man. man. So he like so our hero projects jumps over thirty the feet in the air, <laughs> armed with a stick, just a truncheon. Beats anyway. beats the crap it's, out of. Oh my goodness! It's amazing. You have to watch it anyway. So that's water, it. water guy's introduction involves and him it, wrestling a tiger. Well, he's, they're off to you know. I think I, they weren't very clear. I think there was a wolf pestering the area, so they're trying to kill the wolf. No, no, no. They, they or he, did they? He was the, recruiting them all for the later scene, the best shot in cinema. 
where he deploys all the the, the wild animals. I suppose you suppose. No, but I meant I think because the wolf runs away in that scene. He think. thought he thought they were going to capture a wolf. Yes, a wolf would have been fine. What, what they I'm upgraded saying. to a tiger. Yes, they had to adapt. Well, this is what I was saying. And it turns out that Bomb yeah. can wrestle a tiger just as well as he can wrestle. A wolf. It's Actually, true. strictly speaking, what happened was the tiger roars in his face. Bomb roars louder. <laughs> Beam, sorry, not Bomb. Beam. So apologies. that's another 20 minute intro scene. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then we have this great child rescuing scene. And then 40 minutes into the film, we finally get the, the main title screen. It's fantastic. Yeah. I, I, I will say uh, that it is very long, <laughs> it's kind of overwhelming. It has two of the things that I hate most in movies namely, bad CGI animals and bad child actors. Well, the CGI animals are always tough to do. I know, it's hard, but they're always terrible. Yes. Uh, and there's a lot of them in RRR. A lot of bad CGI animals. Uh, and, of course, they f- they refuse to work with real animals. Yeah. No, no, no. So, uh, so they're, they're forced uh, to use CGI. Yeah, the filmmakers, uh, and, and apparently there's a you know, strong cultural segment. I completely respect that. Like, do, do whatever. Do what you do. I'm just saying that as a viewer, yes. it was very jarring. It's something worth experiencing. But honestly, like, if, if you watch the first, like, 20, 30 minutes and you're like, this isn't for me. It's not going to change your mind. If you watch the first 20 minutes, like, they can't keep this up. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> let me assure you. <laughs> I'll let me assure you that they can <laughs> that, and will. They, they've only started. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this this is at 10 now. There, they, 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 there is no limit to the style. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, anyway, let's, I want to quickly just talk about the very <laughs> uh, the end credit credit scenes. Sure, sure. So, there's an actress in the in the movie that has maybe two lines but man, does she have a singing number at the end? Oh, Many... you, mean, you mean you mean Rom's fiance? Yes. Yeah. She comes to life at the end. Yes. And there's this giant dance scene, and I'm not sure what any of the context is, but it, it's a tribute to a variety of independence and nationalist leaders through India's history. None of whom I recognize because I'm completely ignorant. I'm 100 on the same stage, and even the director gets in on it. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. The the, the... The man with the gray beard and the... Yeah? Yeah, that's the director. Oh! <laughs> I, I had to look that up, but I, I, knew, I had a feeling it was the director, and then I looked, I said, yeah, that's the same guy, that's him there, but with the beard. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. All right, well then. Which I thought was amazing. You know, while well, he had, you know... It's it's great. Uh, it's something, I'll give you that much. <laughs> uh, all right, Triple R. Triple R. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us, listeners, from Masterpiece Theater. Now we'll be able to sleep again. <laughs> I, I, we, I, we let it too pumped. Yeah, we, we got to we got to we got to wind down. How are we gonna do this? Bye bye.